Hi, it's Sue Painter with Confident Marketer, and today we're going to talk about voice, your voice. What does it have to do with your business? How does it help you project your leadership, your confidence, your ability to attract others to your business? And we have a real expert with us today to talk about the voice, and it is my friend from Nashville, Judy Rodman. Judy has over 50 decades of success in the entertainment industry. She is an award-winning vocal coach, a session singer, a chart-topping recording artist, a stage and TV performer, a musician, a public speaker, an author, a hit songwriter, and studio producer and artist development consultant. She is the host and the creator of All Things Vocal Blog, which has almost 2 million views, and she does a podcast with an average of a 1,000 listeners per episode. Judy has been named the best vocal coach by Nashville Music Pros and the vocal coach in residence by TC Helicon's Voice Council magazine. Judy uses her vast experience and her intuitive diagnostic skills to teach her vocal training method, which she calls power, path, and performance, to singers and to speakers online globally. Her clients include major and indie artists, recording artists and labels, artist development companies, touring background and audio studio session singers, public speakers, media personnel, and voiceover talent. Her students and recording clients have appeared on The Today Show, Letterman, Ellen DeGeneres, The Voice, American Idol, America's Got Talent, The Grammys, CMA, ACM, and MTV award shows, and on the New York Times bestseller list. You can find Judy besides her podcast on judyrodman.com. Judy, we are so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for your time. So today I'm talking with my friend from Nashville, Judy Rodman, and I have a special place in my heart for Nashville since I was born there. I'm one of the Oh, few, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm one of the few Nashville natives, and then I moved away. But we're talking today about women in business and voice. And I'll tell you a little bit about why I wanted to talk with Judy about this. I used to run, when we lived in Tennessee, I ran a research, uh, I was the executive director of a, of a research institute, and I had to go up to Washington and make proposals and make presentations a lot. It was in the nuclear industry, and I was always the only woman in the area. <laughs> And I quickly learned that I had to modulate my voice, make it lower, and really speak with authority, or I would be discounted by all the PhD nuclear physicists who were in the room. I also sometimes would be in meetings where there might be another woman or two. We were always in the minority. And if that woman came and tried to present with a very high kind of squeaky voice, None of the guys would listen to her, no matter whether she was a world expert in or not. So that's when I first started noticing. So I asked Judy to come talk with us today. And um, you know from her bio that uh, we led off with this. What a wonderful asset she is to the voice community and to the musical community. So Judy, welcome. And thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Sue. Yeah, this is a fascinating subject. It really is. And... Uh, there's a whole um, cottage industry about this now. They call it audio branding. And there's a podcast by my friend Jody Krangle called Audio Branding. You should you know, look that up too, uh, uh, people. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's like this, how sound uh, changes things. How, yeah. you know, so if, if I can go ahead, you want me to yeah. go ahead and start? Yes, start yes. In? go ahead. I'm okay. all ears, yes. Here is the very first thing people get wrong because our crazy world is so competitive. Mm -hmm. When you think about the voice and about how your voice is and you know, how good it is or whatever, you think that the real, uh, the, the real thing that's important is if your voice is quote unquote good, if it sounds good. Okay. But that is a relative term. It's like sitting on a horse saying horse walk or horse go good. You know, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and the automatic nervous system runs the voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if we don't give it a little more clarity than that, what it does is at best just makes a bunch of sound. 
Uh, and some of the sounds could be really good. Mm-hmm. But uh, instead of that, when I tell people, and, and it, it surprises singers and speakers, you know, when I'll say like, what, what are you trying to do with your voice? Well, I'm trying to sound good. Hmm. The voice doesn't exist to sound good. The voice exists for one reason. And this is where we start. It, deliver, it, uh, it exists to deliver messages, period. Yeah. Period. Yes. So whether spoken this, or whether spoken or sung. Exactly. Yeah. It, it it makes sounds, even if it's moaning for yourself. It's it's trying to soothe your own body. Mm-hmm. Uh, it creates endorphins. It's it's delivering messages. It's delivering messages. And so we've really gotten away from that. Uh, so and and if the reason you start with this is that the automatic nervous system then gets some cues from following the bouncing ball. So let's follow the bouncing ball a bit. Okay. Okay. So now you know you're supposed to be communicating messages. Okay. The next question you need to ask is, okay, to whom am I communicating? (laughs) (laughs) It's so hugely important, you know? And the uh, real magic uh, little thing, a little ninja tip here, is never communicate to all them. Ah. Only ever communicate to the one, to the one heart, either, you know, and and what heart is it? The heart that the words that are coming out of your face are actually to. Now, if there, if you can't see the audience, say Mm -hmm. you're doing a teleseminar or the spotlights in your eyes on stage and you can't see the audience in front of you, you have to make them up. You have to play with the, the little spot, the little atom of sp- uh, spot in oh. your imagination, mm-hmm. and you have to flesh them out. This is acting technique, but real acting is very brave and very honest. It's, as Sanford Meisner says, it is behaving authentically in fictional circumstances. So, Which is difficult it, to do. <laughs> it, exa- exactly, but not really, not if you use your imagination. You do, we do it all the time, you know, really. Uh, it, especially back when we were kids and playing with our imaginary friends. But you, you communicate to the one, you're going to be a laser beam. If you communicate to all them, whether you're singing or speaking, you're going to be a flashlight beam. A flashlight beam can't cut butter. A laser beam can cut a diamond. It's really interesting that you say that because in those years when I would be going, I would spend a lot of time in D.C., kind of walking the halls and doing proposals. And I was very successful at it. So much so that I began being tapped to be the one who would always kind of go up to get the money, as it were. People wanted to know how I could do it. And I used to say, it's because I can read the room. Exactly. But really, now that I'm listening to you, what I'm realizing is I would read the room and I would immediately find the decision maker. And I would just shut out everybody else and talk to that guy. There you go. That tunnel and, vision. And, and yeah. it would work. It was yeah. like the rest of the room kind of fell away almost. Yep. And it was like energy, me to him, like my, you know, my eyes and my voice were there. I didn't consciously do it. I just seemed for whatever reason to, to do it. That is exactly right. And uh, if it is to the whole room, you make it to the one heart of the room. When I work with professors in college or when I work with uh, ministers who are preaching and when I work uh, with business people that are holding seminars and stuff like that, you, what I tell them is make the whole room just exactly what you're talking about, Sue. You know, make them one heart. Make it like one heart. Singers do this too. Think Bono. I think Garth, everybody in their audiences feel like they just, they're just there for them. For them. They make them feel that way. People it's will by say, the way they look. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. mm-hmm. People will say, oh, it was like he was singing just to me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's real stage presence. Whether you're speaking or singing, that is mm-hmm. stage presence. Hmm. And you draw them in. It's not just a laser beam. It is a magnet on steroids. Mm-hmm. Because it pulls people into your message. I'm so, liking this because, you know, I live in the energetic world. I kind of work with my business clients and run my own business, kind of following the energy of things. I've learned that over the years, and I have pretty present intuitive skills. And I was interested in your bio to read also that you talk about intuition as well. 
because mm-hmm. actually, I mean, for you, music, the world of music is certainly energy. I mean, everything is energy, really. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if I am a woman business owner and I feel like I'm not confident when I go out and market or introduce once myself or talk about who I am or what I do, like, where would I start? Would I start by just thinking about I'm really going to meet this one person and I need to make them the focus of my attention? Mm-hmm. Okay. I've got an exercise that I do where okay. it, I show the difference in, 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 in when you flesh this, this person out, this mm-hmm. heart, rather. The heart, yeah. it could be the heart, heart of the whole room or the one person that's the decision maker like you're, you're talking about or even yourself in the mirror if you're doing one of those talks. Uh, you know, like a monologue kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, you first have to figure out who that one heart is and, and make it real to yourself. Yeah. And it's, it's especially hard to do uh, when nobody's there. If you're doing a teleseminar and, you, and you're, you're doing it maybe with, with, uh, without the, the video even. But mm-hmm. how many times do we have conversations on the phone, yeah. right? Yeah. And if we're on the phone, uh, the, the rest of the body thinks, well, we don't need you. So, you know, and it doesn't work. Yeah. But you'll sound like a zombie and you'll get tired. You'll get vocally fatigued too. Yeah. So you have to know who you're talking to and flesh, flesh that out. Then the second thing you, you know, you have to know is what you want them to know. What, where, what mess, what is your message? What do you want them to feel at an emotional level to understand? Even if it's just fun, if it was a joke. What do you want them to feel at an emotional level, not just a surface level, mm. but what you want them to feel? Okay. All right. Now, the last piece of the puzzle here that people don't get to, especially when they're talking about, well, I, I need to feel my message or my song or whatever. Nobody cares what you feel. Mm. It's only about what you make the heart you're talking to feel that makes your voice valuable. So, uh, the net, the, the, uh, I call it the uh, prime directive for the voice or the brass ring, however you want to put it. And this is what it is. It's not enough for you to just spew out your facts or your truth or your message. That could be th- thought of as like a narcissistic vocal. <laughs> okay? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not enough. And, and mm-hmm. people go that far and stop. It's not enough. The thing that makes it valuable is this. Get a response. So that's, that's the end game. Get the response that you want. Uh-huh. And you know what, Sue, I know you know this too. We do that when we write copy. We think, yeah. what do we want them to do? Yes. Okay, so what would, what would their response look like? And uh-huh. it would look like maybe they, they hit the buy button on the product or something yeah. or the consultation or something. Um, well, when you're speaking to a room, what would it look like if you got the response that you wanted? It might mean that everybody froze. That's way more powerful than most polite applause. Yes. Yeah. And so you're looking for that nonverbal body language that says, hmm, you got my attention, right? Oh, it's interesting you say that. When I first started the Confident Marketer almost 20 years ago now, I just was calling it Sue Painter Consulting. And to me, that was kind of like my, you know, people's eyes would glaze over. So I went to make a speech in Knoxville where I used to live one time and there were 22 ladies in the room and I decided that they needed to introduce me differently. So I did a different bio and what they read was, um, Sue is the person who can help you feel confident in your marketing. And immediately I felt and saw (laughs) 22 pair of eyes. Wow. And I sat there and I thought, number one, I'm changing the name of my business to the confident (laughs) marketer, which is how that was born. Yeah. Number two, at the end of it, 18 of those 22 women were my clients. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's getting a response. And it's because (laughs) I get an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even me making an offer. It was just someone introducing me in a bio. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting that you say that because from a business perspective, you're saying, what what do you want? What kind of a response do you want Mm -hmm. out of them? You're not talking right now about, I want them to sign the deal. 
you're talking about, I want an emotional response from them from which the deal follows. Exactly. I want to get their immediate attention. Like if you're singing, uh, you know, a a song about don't you want me back or something like that, the response Mm -hmm. you're talking about is not immediately that they fall into your arms. The response could just be uh, maybe a widening of the eyes. You know, it's like, it's got to be I love this kind of stuff. I could talk about this kind of stuff all day long. Okay. Yeah, it's it's got to be like really real. Okay. And then, and then we get to talk about the voice and the tone of voice and the nuances and the timing and the phrasing and all that kind of stuff. Well, how do you know how to do that? And that is the, the, that's why we started with the first thing. Who am I talking to? Okay. And uh-huh. then and getting to the prime directive, the brass ring. Uh-huh. What response do you want? That tells you what tone of voice that you need. And I, I'll take, uh, if, can we do a little acting exercise? Oh, sure. Of course. It'd yeah. be a blast. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to say four words. I'm going to use you. Uh, can, can, will you play with me here? Of course. Of course. <laughs> okay. <I'll play. laughs> right. Okay. So, and the more nonsensical and, you know, silly, silly kind of stuff, the, the better sometimes, because it gets past the automatic, you know, past the conscious mind and yes. lets you really learn something at a deeper level than just, yeah. just playing. Yeah. So Energetic this is, fun. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to use four, I'm going to use four words I'm going to give you, and you're going to have four different movie scenes. It'll be pretty quick. And I'm going to tell you what the scene is, where you are, when you're saying the same four words, right? Okay. And then I'm going to tell you uh, who you're talking to, and then you'll have a specific response that you want. All right. Okay. Now, the first scene, the first scene is that the four words don't mean anything. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't really understand what the words mean either. You're not really talking to anybody. Okay. That's the first scene. You're not really talking to anybody and the words don't mean anything. All right. I am an aardvark. I'm an aardvark. There you go. Okay. Now, I am an art. You do use the I am part. Okay. Yeah. To use the am because we'll, we'll need that for some. Okay. okay. The second scene is this. You are now back in school in the playground and somebody just called you an art bark. And that's the worst insult you can imagine being called. Okay. And you are mad and you want to intimidate them. Use those same four words to intimidate them. And you do not want to be an art bark. I am an art bark. Exactly. Exactly. That means, what does that make you, right? (laughs) You got my response. Exactly. Okay. Now, the next movie scene is that the nurse has just drawn your blood and found out that you are indeed part aardvark. And you're so happy about that because that means your mama was part aardvark and you were always secretly hoping that was true. Okay. Talk to the nurse and you're going to want to make her smile. I am an aardvark? Sue, so you're a natural. You really could do some acting. All right. And the very last movie scene is you are at the door of the Aardvark Club and they won't let you in because they don't believe you are one. I am an Aardvark. <laughs> Sue, so you're the best. You're the best Aardvark I ever heard. <laughs> okay. Now, here's where we think is just immediately uh, want to sort of reflect on this. Did your body language change? When you gave those different responses, big time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm an aardvark. Yeah. I'm an aardvark. I am an, you know, yeah, yeah, big time. Your face changed, your hands changed, your body posture changed, mm-hmm. everything changed. Did your tone of voice change? Yes, absolutely it did. Yeah. Could somebody on the phone tell the difference in the messages mm-hmm. you were delivering with yeah. the same four words? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. See, what I do is first of all, help people understand what this wonderful thing they have in their neck is for. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the other thing, uh, which is the psychology of it, the physicality of it, this, this physiology of it, uh, there is the, vo- the vocal technique part, is I'm just giving you more access to the variables that then your automatic nervous system can pick from to deliver the message. And I'll tell you, there's some really rotten speakers uh, that have done very, very well. And the reason is they know what I've just told you. Uh They're using their toolkit a whole lot better than some people with a a whole lot more more options Uh because they're throwing in on the prime directive. Who am I talking to? What response do I want from them understanding what I'm saying? I guess they're realizing that they have 
I mean, I was an instrumentalist. I grew up a pianist and a flutist and all that. Wow. I didn't so it wasn't know. like I used my voice, although I used to be in choir way back when. But I guess it is understanding that your voice is not just um, monotone or only one thing. It has a range. It's like an right. instrument. You exactly. can make that instrument just like I can make the instrument do different things on the piano or whatever. So mm -hmm. it really is a tool, but it's a it's an instrument that we can practice and learn to modulate and learn to uh, have, I guess, more technical ability to change it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can expand on the variables, the colors, the tone colors that mm -hmm. people have. I can also, at the same time, help them help protect them from vocal strain, from their own vocal success. You know, uh -huh. I can help them. Yeah. So, and you do it, I do it both ways by posture, you know, getting your breath support and breath control balanced and all that. Uh, the other thing is opening your throat and your throat opens three ways. And here's oh. where the face, the face matters. When you're on the phone, people need to be using their face and their hands, their hands, because it works the, the rib cage a certain way, you know, yeah. uh, but the face by this, and let's do another little experiment. Okay. If you raise, raise your eyebrows, what happens in your nose? Oh, it feels like it. It opens up, right? Yeah, it opens up. It flares right. out. Uh -huh. If I, and I'm going to, I'll just, I'll just do it. If I say one, two, three, and then I just raise my eyebrows, one, two, three, you can hear the difference in my voice. Yes. I've almost doubled my resonance. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, it feels right. my throat. It sounds more throaty. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, which one's going to deliver a, a, the message that you usually want to deliver? Not that one. Not the one, one with no one. Right. This is the one where the math teacher is teaching and she's got like, she's got like one more hour and she's done. Oh my gosh, let it be over. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. this is not the math teacher that's really into it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So eye language is hugely important to the voice. And then also your jaw. If you are tend to be kind of insecure, um, then you're going to speak with more of a ventriloquist kind of voice. I can't hardly do it. <laughs> like but if your you lips don't move, kind of. Mm -hmm. Right. Your jaw doesn't move. Kind uh -huh. of. So if you go one, two, three, do that. Do that. Do it without moving your jaw much. One, two, three. One, two, Good. three. Good. Now move your jaw like Forrest Gump. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yes. Yeah, Feel the difference? You get more air in there for one thing. Well, you are at, you literally open, the, you know, your voice opens up, down, and back. Oh, and so back. your head yeah. coming back helps uh -huh. as well. You want to park your head over your tailbone, over your heel when yeah. you're speaking. Instead of, this is, this is me, you know, like me protested, you need to hear me. You know, this is like me protested too much. Uh -huh. This is, you know, you want what I got. Yeah. And, and you, uh -huh. you pull people, you know, into you that way. Well, it opens up your rib cage. And it opens up your throat. Your throat uh, opens, has a ceiling, yeah. which is the nose, the, the, the nose, which goes all the way up to the eyebrows inside, mm -hmm. and the soft palate. It has a floor, which is tongue and jaw, you know, the, giving the tongue a free ride so mm -hmm. the tongue doesn't get tight. Mm -hmm. And then back, your C1 vertebra, if it goes back just a mm -hmm. little bit, Mm -hmm. You can feel your ears open. Yeah. That's so that little crook, that little post nasal drip zone. Yeah. When that area stretches open, all of a sudden you got access to resonance that you may never have known you, you you've had. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, so that, you know, that all these things instantly increase people's tonal options for the voice to, to pull from. And I think confidence too. I mean, as you're talking, one of the things that's a big bear with me is I'm, I always hate when I see school systems, when are we now music because of a quote cost savings. I think that's not a cost savings. I think that yeah. my early immersion in being in the choir and performing and um, being a musician gave me um an understanding of sound 
and mm -hmm. an understanding of the energy between people because as a performer you always feel that energy and so i'm thinking you know we have such a lack of confidence anyway in this mm -hmm. culture much less in business so i'm thinking that those people probably didn't spend their life embedded in music the first 10 or 12 years of their lives the way I did and probably the way you did. And see, that is a disservice to our school children. It really is. It, it is. Absolutely. Terrible. One thing, one thing that can increase somebody's confidence, though, is to get outside themselves and make it about the person they're talking to. That hard. And, that and, and act. Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and, and you got to ask yourself, why would they, why would they, whether they know it or not, why do they need what I'm trying to give them? And then you have a reason and it's other directed because if yeah. you bottle it up in here, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's like sitting on the horse saying, please, please, please move uh -huh. good. But if you're, if you're going external to a heart, Mm -hmm. when you're using your voice, then you, you can gain, I mean, think about a really shy person that all of a sudden sees somebody, a little old lady in the road or something, and, and they're about to get hit by a bus. Well, all of a sudden that real shy person is going to get a lot of confidence mm -hmm. and go and try to save that, that, you know, with their voice and maybe with their bodies. So it's, it's a situational kind of thing The the thing that makes people insecure are some of the two of the things that make make people insecure are one they don't know who you're they don't know who they're talking to they don't know what the job is they think they're supposed to be just up there getting everything good you know and two uh they they um they don't have the the variables that they really do have they don't have access uh -huh. to their own instrument so that's where, you know, some training could help to help people open up and, yeah. and, and uh, op open up. And then you use psychology and until you get used to doing it, it still can be kind of a butterfly heady experience to go out in front of the public and freak out. But what you can do is act as if, yeah. act as if, and if you know why they need what you have, then act as if they're partially deaf mm -hmm. and then you're huh. going to articulate differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you will. Huh? That's interesting. I never thought about that before. I love what you say about gaining confidence really means not worrying about yourself so much and focusing on the other person. Right. Because when people are unconfident, when I've had clients uh, who needed to market their business and they felt they didn't have the confidence it's because of inevitably they were worried about how they would look or how they would come across or whether they would, it, they, it was all focused inward. And if they started focusing on serving this prospect and maybe turning this prospect into a potential client, then all of a sudden a lot of that unconfidence fell away, but it's hard to get people to make that leap at least the first time it seems. And then as they get well versed in it, they get, it gets easier. Mm -hmm. I'll get, give you a, kind of a story of, of a voiceover uh, talent uh, in New York that I was working with at one point. She was, one of her issues, this particular lesson I remember, is that she was bored with her own work. She's ah. like, I'm, I'm selling gym memberships. Oh, come on, how many hours a day do I have to do it? And I said, we were laughing about it. And I said, because, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of boring, you know, kind of text you can be thought of as, as that. So we went through the little scenario and I said, okay, who are you talking to? All right, as a woman, middle age. Okay. Well, why does she need a gym membership? And we went through a backstory of her. Well, she's very, very, she had a, a terrible lack of confidence. She gained too much weight. She felt like her husband was drifting and she was just like, she felt like you could just pick her up with a fly swatter. She just, she just was really, just didn't think life was even worth living anymore. Mm. You're going to save her life. You're mm -hmm. going to save her whole trajectory by selling her a gym membership. Yeah. Now go do that. And mm -hmm. it changed everything. It changed their whole copy. And she used that in a, with other products. And here's, here's the thing. And I, I, I know you well enough, Sue, that you'll, I know you'll agree with me. If it's not good for whoever you're talking to, you got to get another product exactly. <laughs> or another service. 
Yeah. In fact, I have a, I have a book about how to have a sales conversation and I talk about when mm-hmm. not to make an offer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When the mm-hmm. signs are right and when the signs are not right. I really love that. I mean, it, this is such a fascinating topic to me and it really is um, get outside of yourself and make mm-hmm. that kind of energetic or heartfelt connection with the person you're speaking right. with. And it goes back. It's funny to me that music has so much to, and sound has so much to do with basic business principles because in basic business principles, we're always told, make sure you're talking to the decision maker, that one heart, <laughs> that right person. We're mm-hmm. always told, go write an avatar as to who your ideal customer is and really flesh it out, just like you were doing with the voiceover artist. It's fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah. It's like everything's connected. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, and then you get, you start getting really good at it and you want to get even better then there's little things like i'm working with uh, an african-american young man who is going to change the world he's wow. amazing i want to meet his mama someday because she must be really special but he could not say his ths they were dat and dis mm-hmm. and that was going to limit him yeah. well we worked on his his ths and for the first time he's saying ths and he sent me a testimonial he said my my life has totally changed now that i can say ths he said and i'm about this is a teenage kid he's about to he's about to uh give a keynote uh in a room with a potential of several hundred people wow (laughs) that's fabulous and i'm glad you brought that up because before we end i had to say me being from Nashville and having a Southern accent, <laughs> it, ha- it sometimes is commented upon, not usually when I'm speaking, but like in social situations. And I always kind of get my back up a little bit because I'm thinking, look, you're from Jersey. I'm having a hard time understanding you. But what do you, what do you advise? Do you feel like people should try to speak more without their accent or just let it roll because it is what it is? I think that uh, if it's affecting what you want to do in your life, address Uh it. That's what I think. And a lot of times I'm I'm working with somebody right now who is a public speaker and all kinds of things And she, with, with her Southern accent, Uh she's from Uh back in, you know, uh, she's actually uh, the daughter of a famous steel player. But anyway, she had uh, the, the biggest deal with her is her voice sounded harsh and she's not, she didn't mean her, she didn't want her messages to be harsh. Mm -hmm. You know what it was? It's ours. Instead of saying Mm -hmm. like her R's were mostly like, uh, you know, pirate R's Mm -hmm. like her heart heart and her R's were really back there, you know, Mm -hmm. and she loosened her R's up. So I had her pretend to, you know, like when you were a little kid, you couldn't say oh, Oz, let's say some things without well, Oz. Mm-hmm. And so she messed around with that and we played around with that for a long time and on one lesson. And all of a sudden, her jaw started moving around and now her R's are way more pleasant. So it's not, you know, sometimes it's not the accent. It's just something like that that makes the message sound harsh. Yeah, I had a guy um, when I was speaking, I'm, I speak Spanish somewhat wow and one of my um one of my own mentors happens to be cuban and immigrated to the united states one day we were having lunch and he said okay we'll speak spanish and then at the end he said you're never going to be credible unless you learn how to say your o drop your jaw and it's Uh. like oh oh." (laughs) it's not o like you say but it's oh oh Oh. drop your jaw (laughs) and sure enough I went to Mexico not long after that. And so I was doing this all thing. And the guy was like, you've got a wonderful accent. <laughs> it just thrilled me. Oh, my death. goodness. And so, funny? yeah, it maybe just, it is yeah. just those little things yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want to be a newscaster in, 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 you know, Indiana, or you want to be an actor and you need to learn an English accent, you know, those are, those are diction lessons and you really need to dig in. But for really, for regular message delivery, again, who are you talking to? How do they need you to say it so that they can respond like you want them to? It just comes back to that. It always Here comes back come. to that. Yeah. That's and if you, the too. last thing is fatigue. The vocal fatigue thing has to do with posture because uh-huh. what you need to do is control breath. Mm-hmm. It all, and it can come from a tight throat too. But if you will... Um, 
like your the use your core and your lats in your back mm -hmm. and flexibly keep yourself tall and open and not let the old ladies dowagers hump mm -hmm. you know kind of whether mm -hmm. you're a man or a woman kind of kick in uh, like uh, you stay like that your your body may be weary at the end of the day and you may get physically hungry but your voice is going to feel great so keep your lats back and kind of keep yourself aligned over your center mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep so, Those are great, so great your, tips. I really your power, them. Yeah. Your power should come from your hips, not from your rib cage or your throat. Mm -hmm. Your power, sing your butt off, you know, speak your butt off so you don't speak your throat out. <laughs> you ah, okay. That's cool. Well, so yeah. if people want to know more about this or if they want to pursue something and say, oh, I want you to help me because I'm on a speaker circuit or whatever, do they go to judyrodman.com? Yes. Okay. They just go to Judy and, and there's my contact information right there. And I good. love working with speakers of all kinds. Yeah. That's good to know. Judy, I am in awe of you. You just have so <laughs> much experience and so much wonderful knowledge for both people who are singers and people who are speakers. And I love that. And I also love that we ended up talking about the energy of things because that's my yeah. gig. That's my gym. Yeah. I just love that. Thank you so much for your Well, time. I'm in awe of you. And so thank you so much for inviting me. It was great. Oh, to yes. Anytime. We'll do it again. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.